exciting edition of Game Plan. If you are new to the platform, we like to say welcome. Thank you for joining. Game Plan's concept is basically sports. You have to have a game plan to win in your sports. Same thing applies to life. So we invite former or professional collegiate athletes to come and to tell you about their game plan, how they made it in uh, college and professional football or baseball or basketball or tennis, whichever sport they played, and how did they mm -hmm. transition into the field of science and medicine? So today's guest speaker, we have Dr. James Cherry, who has a PhD and works at the NIAID. He also played sports, college football at Shepherd University, who he said currently is in the final four. So I know he's excited. <laughs> he's going to gloat a little bit about it. <laughs> so we have him and thank you for our your time. We greatly appreciate it. Um, and we're just going to open up the floor for you to tell your story. Then after that, sure. uh, we'll go to some Q&A questions. So take over and thank you for joining. Yes. Well, first and foremost, guys, I want to thank uh, Dr. Miller and Mr. Smalls for, you know, inviting me and extending the invitation. I was, it's an honor to be here. I think this program is absolutely amazing. I really enjoyed just kind of learning a little bit about it. <clears throat> you know, in my time, we talked in the, in the summertime. And so I've been really anxious to get here. And so um and for those of you guys that are that are joining, you know, welcome. I think you guys are uh, in a, a beautiful platform to kind of think about what's next, right? How am I going to proceed? How am I going to move forward? And this is something I can promise you I did not have in the 90s <laughs> when I was uh, going through school. So, uh, you know, let me just kind of introduce myself a little bit and a little bit of background. So, um, so I, I grew up uh, I was born in Brooklyn, uh, in Coney Island. Uh, my majority of my family lives out in Queens, Long Island, and in Brooklyn. <laughs> uh, my parents moved us down to Maryland um, in the 80s, and um, I pretty much grew up in, in Maryland. And um, was very fortunate to learn at an early age that you know education was the key to any successes that we wanted to have. Um, but I also, <laughs> as a number of you guys are, uh, young students at that time, young kids, we really, you know, our parents used to have much words of wisdom for us, right? So I loved playing football. Um, I was good at it, but I was also blessed to have parents that made it crystal clear that I can't play without an education. So that was, that was good. That, you know, and I, as much as I argued with them many years ago, I, I look back now and I'm very thankful that they, uh, you know, instilled that in my mind immediately. Um, so during my time uh, in Maryland, you know, I played football in high school. I was good. I, you know, I was captain of the football team. We won two state titles while I was there and got recruited by a number of, of um, big schools, um, you know, a couple D1 schools um, and a lot of D2 schools. And, um, you know, I selected Shepard mainly because, one, I really wanted to play right away. I'm going to be honest with you. And I'll be the first to tell you guys, I genuinely felt that if I'm good enough to go to the show, I'll, I'll get I'll, I'll get there. Right. So I wanted to play right away. They had won a championship. I got a full scholarship to go there. And my scholarship was not only just for football, but it was for academics. So that was a good thing. Mom and dad were pretty happy about that. So um, I basically had a full ride while I was at Shepherd. Um, and, and while I was there, we did one, uh, two championships, which was great. But one of the, I think the best things that ever happened to me when I was at Shepherd was I got injured, um, which I think was the, the probably the first light that really kind of came on. Um, it was clear to me that, you know, I, I, I was getting older. <laughs> when you get, when you're younger, you don't think about this, but, you know, um, and um, I got hurt and I was at a small liberal arts college and um, I had to sit out a season and I was very fortunate to have mentors, um, you know, in my life, uh, professors that really kind of took an interest in me. And um, I was doing well in school. Um, I, at the time, honestly, I was an econ economics major. Um, and I had this bio professor who just, he, you know, he was an athlete. He wrestled, matter of fact, D1, University of Minnesota. And he said to me, he goes, you know, he goes, and they all called me JC when I, um, when I was playing. And he said, JC, you know, I, 
you know, you really need to think about biology. And I said, oh, I, I, it's a lot of work. <laughs> you know, I really didn't want to do it. And he said, well, listen, you've got to figure this out because you're not going to play professional football. It's, you know, I, I found this number out just recently. It's one out of, you know, 100,000 that are going to play professional sports, right? And, um, and I wasn't playing at Maryland. You know, I wasn't playing at Syracuse or anything like that, you know, or UNC. I was playing at Shepard, which they were good, but, you know, it was going to be a long shot. And so that really kind of sunk in for me because I really wanted to live well, right? And, you know, when you think about these athletes, you know, they, they do well um, financially. And I said, okay, well, I've got to figure this out because it's not going to be football. That football was a great tool um, and it got me a free education. And I didn't let football use me. I used football. Um, and looking back, it was the best thing that ever happened. Um, so I ended up graduating with a biology. I switched my major to a bio major. Um, you know, I graduated in four years and, um, which was good. And, and, and I had a GPA high enough to get into Hopkins and I started my doctorate in molecular medicine, um, at John Hopkins university, um, and did my research at the national cancer Institute. And I was very fortunate that they were, uh, willing to fund that, um, education. So that was, you know, and at that moment, I kind of realized that you know, there was so much more I learned from just playing the sport. I mean, I got a lot of, you know, battle scars, which I think we all have that played sports. Right. Um, and I had, I had some hardware, which was nice and I still wear it. And, um, you know, and, and, um, and I enjoy that and I enjoy, and I even have my shepherd shirt on and, and I'm still very connected to that football team, but I always tell everyone that there's so many things that I've learned, um, from being a student athlete that I, I got to tell you generally, especially in a field of, uh, life sciences that a lot of our colleagues in that field don't have, right? I'm not saying there's, I'm not saying there's not some of us out there that play sports, but, you know, dealing with the ability to, as you guys all know, to grind and get ready for your sport. Um, I, I've been able to take that into my career, right? Um, I've been able to deal with situations where, you know, maybe an experiment doesn't go well, or I did poorly on an exam, or, you know, I've got a balance between, you know, spending time with, my girlfriend now, my wife, at, <laughs> my girlfriend at the time, my wife now, or friends to be able to manage that. Um, and it made me think, okay, it's just like sports, right? You know, I can either, you know, go and lay around and watch TV and eat bonbons and then try to play football, or I can go to the gym, I can watch film, I can study. Um, and I took those same tools that were in my toolbox from playing sports to the field of life sciences. Um, and I was very fortunate because it really helped me to deal with a lot during my time in grad school. And, um, and I will promise you guys, the road um, to getting to that success is not a straight one, right? It's, it's very curved and there's bumps and all kinds of issues come up and there's going to be times and I can promise you there's times where I was knocked down many times, right? Um, and, you know, I got to be honest with you, looking back, those failures are what allowed me to be successful, right? It's not you know, getting the degree or getting the big job or, you know, you know, receiving an award from Dr. Collins. And, you know, those are great, but it's the times where I failed that allowed me to say, okay, how am I going to do this differently? How am I going to approach this differently? Right. Um, you know, because in my eyes, and I think it's the same in sports, you know, my coach used to always tell me, right, you can be that loser that lays on the ground or you can get yourself up, dust yourself off and reattack, right. And figure out a new plan to make it work. So that happened a lot. And I, you're going to see that in in our career right there's 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 challenges there's lots of challenges um you know and you've got to be able to get over those challenges it's not going to be easy and it wasn't an easy path so i'll tell you guys just to give you a little bit more background so you know i got into hopkins um you know started my doctorate in in biomedical sciences and you know was with the nci and then hopkins decided after my master's that i couldn't be at the nci anymore and I had to come to Hopkins. And I thought, well, I don't want to go to Hopkins. It's in Baltimore. I'm, I'm here. You know, I had projects set up. I had advisors set up. Everything was working fine. Um, so in 2000, they said either you come to Hopkins or you have to go somewhere else to, get your, to do your PhD. We'll give you your master's. And um, I had to make a decision, right? Uh, you know, I had to decide to no longer do that. And I was getting a, a nice stipend from the NCI that was more than I would have gotten at, the, at Hopkins. So I was going to be in a, a more debt. Um, the NCI was no longer going to pay for it. So, you know, that was going to be a difficult situation. Um, but I had to deal with it, right? So it was either, do I want to get this PhD, right? Or do I want to just, 
you know, or how am I going to do it? So I decided not to go to, I didn't decide to leave Hopkins and I did. I left Hopkins um, and I took a year. Um, and as I worked with the NCI and worked with a couple of other universities, um, and I was fortunate enough that we had a connection at Catholic University of America that was more than willing to allow me to do my research project at the NCI on molecular profiling of ovarian tumors, which I'd already started accruing samples, patients from the clinical center. You know, the project was on the road. It would have also just leaving Hop, leaving NCI and joining Hopkins full time. It would have put me back in the two to three years to complete that PhD. And for whatever bureaucracy reason it was, it was a situation that arose. Right. So I could have cried about it or I had to kind of reassess. So instead of losing three years, I did lose one year of classwork, but I did. I was able to continue to accrue the samples, you know, do some more literature researching. I started to do some more data analysis on what I was doing. So when I got to Catholic University um, in 2003 or 2002, I was off and running. Um, and so I finished up my my Ph.D. there um, in biology with a concentration in biomedical science. Um, so I was able to find a way to still be able to achieve my goal. Now, I, I think a lot of the time I think about, um, and just kind of looking back and, and, you know, it's funny because when, when I was asked to, to join the session and kind of talk to you guys, I really wanted to think about how is it I'm going to be able to, um, portray to you guys that this is not, um, it, you know, success is not for the weak. Right. It's not for the weak at heart. It's not an individual that just expects it to come. Right. Um, you know, in my new role and at, at, at NIAD as the associate director, we have a lot of really, really smart postdocs that come in. Right. Um, and, um, and what I see a lot of times with these postdocs that come into my branch, I realize that they're not used to the challenges. They're not used to failures. Right. They used to be able to figure everything out because it's in the book. Right? I've read the book, I understand it, I'm a photo back memory, blah, blah, blah. Well, that's great, that's excellent, but um, we're doing research now, right? There is no answer, right? You've got to figure out what that answer is. Nothing written down, no one's done it before. We're looking at to figure out what's the best path to go. And we see a lot of those postdocs, MD, PhDs, nurse practitioners that are not up to that challenge or have to learn how to deal with that adversity, right? Adversity. And, and that's something I think us as athletes deal with every day. You guys deal with that in your sport. Um, if it's tennis, if it's basketball, swimming, whatever that is, you deal with that adversity, right? And I think where a lot of athletes, in my eyes, I think kind of miss the message is, is that if you're not one of those individuals that do go to the professional level, how do you take what you've learned on the court, in the pool, on the field, you know, in the gym to your career? Right. How do you how are you able to make that transition? And that's something it takes. you got to you got to see the bigger picture. Right. In my eyes, you know, you're learning this stuff. I learned a ton there on the football field that I constantly to this day am still applying to my position at, at NIA. Right. Um, I'll have conversations with Dr. Fauci or Dr. Holland or Dr. Sharpless at the NCI, the NCI director. And, and they always say, well, Jim, you always have such a positive attitude about these new projects. So what, I, I can complain, right? But is that going to help? We got to get it done. So I got to hit the ground running. So let's get to work, right? So, you know, it's, just, it's the same way I approach football, right? I mean, if I've got, you know, when I came into college, I was underweight, right? I was only 215 pounds. To be a starting tight end, I need to be about 255. So what did I do? I ate a lot, lifted a lot of weights, <laughs> you know, learn the playbooks, I get on the field. It's the same thing in my eyes, um, at least for my career, is what I've done. So, um, so now what I've done is spent a lot of time, um, you know, playing a big role, not only at, at NIAD, and NIAD, um, as Dr. Miller and Mr. Smalls know, um, is a new position that I just joined. Uh, I, I stayed with the NCI until January, July of this year, where I was heading the COVID-19 response, um, where we were developing um, standards, the national standards for the nation as we were testing for antibodies. We, if you guys recall, you know, during that period of time, there was so much information going on at the end of 2019, beginning of 2020 about, you know, does this assay work? Can we determine if they have the antibodies? And there was no, it was just kind of a, it was a real a wild, wild west. And when we sat down, um, matter of fact, with the White House and the CDC and the FDA, um, you know, they, Dr. Sharpless, who's the director of the NCI, said, well, you know, Dr. Cherry's lab can test all the assays, right? We've talked, he's, he's reached out to me, and I told him we could do it. 
we had the Elizas, we had the controls, we had the samples we needed. Um, and in a matter of three months, we were up and running. And today we've tested over 200 of those commercial assays that are on the market, right? That you guys are using today, that hospitals are using. We're working with Mount Sinai, we're working with Hopkins, we're working with Georgetown, GW, um, you know, uh, Mayo Clinic, Cleveland Clinic. And, and, you know, they come to us now to determine what's the best control to use. How do we do the serious surveillance for cancer patients, autoimmune disease patients, um, you know, um, you know, compromised patients, right? And so, and guys, I, I'll promise you, I was not this brainiac, right? I wasn't this guy that got 4.0 grade point average. I wasn't, right? Uh, even in high school and undergrad, I, you know, like 3.0, 3.2, I studied a lot. I'm that guy that spends a lot of time reading and studying, right? Because to me, it, you got to get prepared for the game. And everything in my eyes is a game. That's why I enjoy what I do, right? You know, I teach. You know, I was talking to Mr. Smalls earlier today. He was talking to my assistant. You want me to join early? So well, I got to teach tonight. I, I teach graduate school at Hood College where I'm a tenure professor. And um, I do all that not because of the money. I don't do it for that. I do it because I love it, right? It's not work to me, right? It's just like what I do. Just like football was what I did. It was, I loved football. I loved getting up at four in the morning and, and working out and training. I love to this day. I get up at four in the morning. I work out and then I start to work. I start work at 6 a.m. and I don't get done until about eight. Right. But I, I enjoy every minute of it. It's not work to me. I could do it. They, I mean, and I think, God, they pay me for this. This is great. <laughs> you know, they pay me a salary. I get to meet great people. Um, so that's the other thing I've been really fortunate to be a part of is that um, I, I've taken my passion from the football field and being an athlete, took what I learned by many coaches, not only at the high school level, but at the college level, um, and I apply it to my everyday work now. Right. I apply it. And I, you know, and it's, it's funny because, you know, we meet a lot of people and I'm sure Dr. Mill will tell you the same thing that are not athletes in our field. Right. They're not, they're not athletes. Right. Um, they're introverts, they're 4.0s, you know, and they're great just working on that project and just, you know, and, and as you guys probably all know, a lot of these physicians, they have really poor bedside mix. They don't, they don't know how to talk to people. Right. They don't know how to deal with adversity. Right. And that's something I think is um, it's, it's sad. Right. Because it's something we need. Right. Because there's a lot of people in the lay public that don't understand the science um, and you want to help them understand it so they can educate it. Um, and so that's another piece we've also done. So now today I spend a lot of time. I'm, I'm on the board of governors at my university at Shepherd. I was asked to come back. Um, I've been on the board of governors there at Shepherd for about two years now, going on my third year as a secretary. But the other thing that's been great is um, at the beginning of this season, and I was, you know, as, as Mr. Small explained, we, you know, this season has been a great season for us. So they're in the final four, um, and they just won this beautiful game. It was on ESPN top 10 uh, last week, and I was so proud of them. Uh, but at the beginning of the season, the coach reached out to me, and he said, JC, I, you know, I need you to come talk to the football team. And I said, well, coach, what do you, what do you need? All right? And he said, well, you know, these guys, you know, and got to remember, it's, small, it's a liberal arts school, Division II school in West Virginia. Right. And um, so you've got a very uh, wide array of cultures from very, very country. Right. You know, um, southern West Virginia, you know, Kentucky area. You got some urban areas. Right. You got some kids from the D.C. watch Boston metropolitan area. You got some Florida area that come play for us. And it's been it's you know, he said they don't understand the vaccine, you know, and right now we only have about a. 20% vaccine rate on the football team. And they were going to start the season. And I said, okay. And he goes, you know, I was wondering if you come talk to them. You know, your name's on the wall, got a championship here. You know, you're leading this effort for the NCI and the NIH. You know, do you mind? And I said, of course, I'm happy to come, right? And the first thing, and I got to tell you, it was such an, it was an amazing feeling, right? I love coming back to that stadium and seeing my, seeing my, you know, going to the stadium and just seeing what we did in the past. But then to sit down with some of these athletes now, Right. And, and, you know, and I don't remember being that big, but they're big, <laughs> very small. I'm old. So, and we sat down and we talked and I got to tell you, the conversation was absolutely amazing because I didn't talk to them as scientists. I didn't talk to them as physicians. I didn't talk to them as, you know, as clinicians. I talked to them as athletes. Right. And I explained to them, you know, the role of the vaccine and what it does in your body. And I explained to them, I, I gave the analogy of sports, right? I said, as you prepare for a game, you watch film, you know what the other team's gonna do. This is kind of what the vaccine's doing for your immune system. I tried to make that equation for them. And they started to get it. 
And then they really opened up with some great conversation, right? Conversations which were valid, right? We had kids that are living in multi-generational homes um, that the first thing they said was, Dr. Cherry, well, tell us what you think about, you know, is this going on with the, the, the Tuskegee study? And I said, you know, that it, I was impressed. I was like, well, yeah, that happened. You're right. You know, and they were concerned. Is that something that's happening here now? And I said, no, it's not. We learned from that, right? That was the whole, you know, that's a mistake we made. We learned from it. We acknowledge that mistake. And that's not what's going on here. I helped them understand the value, the benefit. And I also explained to them, guys, if I were in your shoes at 18, 19, 20 years old in the 90s, and this was a happen, I'd be in the same boat. Like, you think you're invincible right? You're lifting all these weights. You're, you know, you're, you're an amazing athlete. You're in great shape. You're a college player. You know, I'm fine. If I get it, I'll be fine. But I, you know, I try to explain to them, guys, it's not like that. It's not as simple as the flu, right? This is something. And I had to get them to understand the gravitas of their decisions. And the great thing about it, this went on, was supposed to go on for an hour and ended up going for two hours, which was great because that meant we just were having great conversation and dialogue back and forth. Just wonderful questions, questions about, you know, fertility issues because they're reading things about fertility issues. And I know as a scientist, that's not what's happening, but they don't understand that, right? And, and one of the things I think uh, that, you know, I always feel this way that the, the message was just sometimes missed, right? How we could deliver that message to the lay public so they could understand it, right? Not talk to them as scientists and physicians and clinicians, but talk to them as individuals that can equate understand right and so i was really happy they were asking some of the questions they were asking i was very proud of the fact that they felt comfortable to talk to me about it some of them even reached out to me afterwards you know and i told them i said guys my name's on the wall i've got a championship it's up there right you guys my name's there right it's not i'm not some you know uh nerd in the lab right i was on this gridiron i bled on that football field just like you guys are too and the beautiful thing about it was by the middle of September, they were 90% vaccinated. And it was just an exciting time because they, I felt like the message I was trying to deliver to them got through, right? I tried to explain to them, guys, this is, enjoy the time, but let's not, let's not lose it, right? Because you can get sick, you can get really ill. And that was something I wanted them to understand, but I didn't want to scare them either, right? So that was important to me. And so that's some of the stuff that I tried to, to do with the team. And, and I've been on the sideline several times with them and just very proud of what they're doing. Um, and so these are, and I look back and I, I think about it and, you know, me and Mr. Smalls were talking earlier and just, I think back and to me, it feels like yesterday that I was, I was playing the nineties on not that long ago. And I tell a lot of my graduate students now, like I'm the old guy in the room, right? I used to be the young guy. Um, and I, I talked to them and just explain to them that even in my graduate level classes, that I teach with these kids. I tell them, I say, guys, this is not supposed to be easy, right? If it was easy, everyone would do it. Right. If it was easy, everyone would get their PhDs, right? Or get their MDs or their farm Ds, right? Or masters. It's not supposed to be easy. Right. And I also explained to them that they can always take the easy road, but I promise you it will take longer to get there. Just take the hard road, right? Just do it. Do what you're supposed to do. Spend the time in studying. Spend the time and acknowledge the fact that you've got to make a decision. You've got a consequence at the end of that, right? Do you want to study and prepare for the, you know, the thesis exam or the final exam? Do you want to prepare for the experiment? Do you have to come in on a weekend? you know, spend that time to do it, right? And that's kind of more or less what we try to get across to these students. And I think we've done a very poor job, and I'll admit this, uh, you know, at, at least at our university, where we explain to these students that it's not just about regurgitating, right? Because I know Mr. Miller will tell you, it ain't about regurgitating, right? It's, it's about your ability to, to, to be able to assess the problem, just like on the field, just like on the court, right? You know, if you, you know, if you're running, you know, a drag route and you realize that, you know, the, the two gap set, uh, safety is up, run a post corner, right? Run the corner, you read the defense, right? You got to do the same thing in science, right? You got to apply it. So these are things that I've applied to myself in the field. Now, the other thing I've also been able to do, and I'm happy to do, is the NIH has allowed me to be <clears throat> the scientific advisor for all the students that come through um, the national lab up in Frederick. So, um, and we get a lot of student athletes um, and, and, and we have these same kind of conversations. I think that what Mr. Smaltz and Dr. Miller put together, um, you know, is amazing in comparison to what we're doing <laughs> up there in Frederick, but it really allows them to get an appreciation for there's more of the life out there. Enjoy the sport, you know, don't, um, don't take it for granted um, from that perspective, um, it, you know, but, don't you don't let the sport use you use the sport to get what you need to get right and, and for me it was the education it was a free education um the opportunity to get the degrees that i had um that i have now and the opportunities that have been afforded to me through the nih um from the national cancer institute to be able to become a 
you know, get a doctorate in molecular medicine. Um, and now be the associate director um, under Dr. Fauci and Dr. Sharpwood, uh, Dr. Um, Holland at NIAD, right? So as we work on the, on the COVID uh, pandemic. Um, so that's, you know, that's more or less kind of, you know, my path. Um, one of the things I don't, and I don't know, and, and Mr. Smalls, you have to tell me, I, I had this video up from the NCI. I don't know if that's been, if they've seen this, but I, I would like to just take a few moments if they haven't seen it to share kind of a little bit of the story that the NCI put together on me a couple uh, years ago. Is that okay with you or has that been shared already? Yes, you have co-hosting rights, so you can share the screen. Perfect. Anyway. Perfect. So let me just take a minute, guys. And then after that, guys, please, I don't want you guys to feel like you get to sit and lecture. If there's some questions or, you know, topics we want to discuss, feel free just to kind of jump in and, you know, ask me anything. But I'm going to just share this video. Give me one second. Um, let's see. What screen am I at? Right, here it goes. So... Once again, if any of the listeners have any questions while we're getting this set up, please you can raise your hand. You can come off mute. You can ask a quick question. So, Dr. Cherry, it's good to see you. I remember meeting you many, many years ago. We think it's been, I think it's been about 15 years when well, I met you. Dr. Cherry, you're on mute again. <laughs> I think he's doing some of the video. Yeah, there you go. Can you hear me now? Yeah. And I remember you and I were the only brothers in the room. We were. <laughs> That's very common, I think, for us. Very, right? We're very, unicorns. <laughs> look, I was surprised and happy to see you, and I'm sure the same. <laughs> yes, I was very, very thankful. <laughs> it's very rare. <laughs> so, so, so for the folks on the, on the call, what I'm talking about, uh, Dr. Cherry and I are involved in research resource overseeing core facilities, which is high-end research equipment. And we were at a meeting. And I was relatively new to the field in this particular area. He had been doing it for a while, and I just didn't expect to see any brothers. I think the meeting was actually in, was it in Boston? Was it in Massachusetts or New Hampshire? It was in Boston. Yeah, it was in Boston. Yep. In Boston, yeah. So that was yep. interesting. So you, you talked a lot about your, your work at um, um, in, um, NIH. Can you, can you give the group, I don't think they realize the important role you played in the in the, in the COVID pandemic. And, and I know that sure. you talked a little bit about it, but it's not just the science that you were doing. You were dealing with the politics of science. Yes, <laughs> yes, I was. Dr. Lowe, I was, yes, yes. Which is very interesting. I, I, I got to tell you, it was, a new, it was a new game for me to play. <laughs> so, so we're not getting into it too much. Can you just tell the group you know, the, the, sure. the type of meetings that you were in and the kind of people you were interacting with? Sure, sure. No, that's a great, great question. So one of the things um, that, you know, besides just the pandemic in itself, right, it was it was really the fear, right, the unknown, right? Um, you know, one of the things that, you know, Dr. Miller and I know in the scientific field is, it, you know, you have to approach everything with a scientific method. Um, it's not something you just kind of answer and respond to, right? It takes time to understand, you know, gather information and report that information. Um, and as you guys recall, during that period of the pandemic, early in the pandemic, there was so much misinformation that was being shared out there, unfortunately. Um, and we really felt that we had to find a way to get, get a hold of that, right? And if you guys recall, and I, I'm sure it actually like to us, um, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic, we were, you know, we had, you know, countries ordering two, four, five million dollars worth of antibody tests to see if people had antibodies to the SARS-CoV-2 and you know what they were and and the kits were supposedly you know going to deliver this information and they come to find out you know 90 percent of the kits did not deliver on the promise that the company said they did and the fda gave emergency use authority and it was things were out there and and that was the kind of breaking point i think for the national institute of health um so my boss uh, dr sharpless was contacted by the white house um, and Dr. Fauci, and basically said, we've got to figure this out. You know, what can we do to help the FDA, right? What can we do to help the FDA? And so one of the things and um, that we have in our toolbox, uh, being in the United States, is we have this national lab. And this national lab, which is located up in Frederick, is the only national lab that does biomedical research, right? And the whole purpose of that is, and you got to, and, and you know, you guys won't understand this, but during the AIDS pandemic, 
um, the National Lab in the 80s played a big role because they're the ones that grew up large bats of the virus so they could screen the blood supply, right, in the 80s. So, you know, Dr. Sharp said, you know, we've got to get, we got to, the National Lab needs to help because the National Lab can do things that we can't do in the government, right? It has authorities, right? And this is where I kind of started to really learn kind of, I think where you're getting to, Mr. Mill, Dr. Miller, is the, is, the, um, is the politics, right? The public health initiative, right? And so the first thing we had to do was to not only educate a number of our administration on the value of utilizing the national lab, but we also had to be able to help the CDC to understand and appreciate the FDA to understand and appreciate as well as the public health community, right? Because we had everyone going in different directions and we weren't all going in the same direction. The national lab, my program played a huge role in helping us direct our efforts all in the same place. And the first thing we had to do was get control over these assays that were coming from the commercial sector. So the first thing we did was partnered with the FDA and every company. So if Dr. Miller and I had a company, you know, we submit our findings on our assays to the FDA. The FDA submits that information over to the national lab and then has Dr. Miller and I send samples to the laboratory at the national lab to test those assays to see, okay, what Dr. Merrill and Dr. Cherry said these assays can do, can do. Do they have the sensitivity? Do they have the specificity? Do we have the supply chain <laughs> to be able to deliver them to the public, right? And that was one of the big things we had to work on. And so we really, we screened probably over 2,000 commercial assays. And to this day, we've only approved because they just did not deliver on what they said they would, or they weren't able to supply the, the, the tools, correct? Because they were, unfortunately, there were countries that were getting, uh, getting kits from China. We were having supplies issues from China because unfortunately our administration was having some issues with China. So we had to find a place that could do everything here in the States that was able to deliver on those. And so we only have approved to this day, 200 commercial assays that are approved by the FDA that have been tested by my laboratory. We also were the ones that had to stand up the standards. So we had to work with Mount Sinai. We worked with Hopkins. Um, we worked with Sloan Kettering. We worked with uh, Cleveland Clinic. And we worked with um, the Mayo Clinic. And we were able to get samples. And the key here, and this is in kind of funny, you said this, Dr. Miller, earlier, we wanted to make sure we had a good, diverse population, right? So we wanted to have Blacks, Latinos, Whites. We wanted um, patients that were cancer, immunocompromised, autoimmune. We wanted to get all these samples that we we're going to develop as controls because these individuals were exposed to the virus. We wanted to make sure, could we detect lower levels of the antibodies versus higher levels of the antibodies? So a person is um, autoimmune or immune compromised, the antibody response may be a lot less, but we got to see, is it there or not, right? And these were some of the things we had to do. And then <laughs> the piece that was really interesting was being able to explain that to not only the administration that are not scientists, but also to explain that to the public, right? So they can understand here's the value added. And, um, and again, I took a lot of the knowledge from my sports. I didn't talk to them as scientists. I knew a lot of them weren't scientists. You know, when I sat down and I'll be honest with you, I gave a presentation um, to former President Trump and I, I really did kind of simplify it drastically, right? Just to the point where he could appreciate, understand what was being accomplished and how we were going to accomplish. I didn't talk to him as a scientist. I didn't talk to him like I was talking. To, I'd be talking to you or Dr. Fauci or Dr. Sharpless because they're scientists or clinicians, right? Where we can speak differently. So that was a piece I've been learning um, that I went through for the last two, the last two years <laughs> as we stood up the Sirenet operation, which is now stood up, and we got funds from the Paycheck Paycheck Protection Act about three hundred nine million dollars they awarded us to be able to do this work. So thank you. Uh, thank you. It'd be great for some, some other students to follow, but I just want to put a point on this. You have been in a position where you've had to explain policy to presidents. Yes, I have. I have. And presidents that, uh, you know, just not in line with what I want, but yes, <laughs> I had to do that. Yes. And, and, and again, you got to remember where they're coming from, right? You've got to be able to speak to your audience, right? And that's important. Um, you know, I, I did not explain it the same way that I, I sat down before that presentation and, and explained it to Dr. Fauci and Dr. Sharpless, who are clinicians, right? We were able to get into the nuts and bolts of the science and how it's working and the difference between the immunoglobulins A and G and M. And I didn't get into that with, with the administration, right? <laughs> I just said, here's the antibodies, here's how it works, you know, more or less, right? So they could get an appreciation of why we were doing these tests because they, they, everyone wanted to know why are these kits out there? How do we get them fixed, right? 
So it's a long way from the football field to the Oval Office. Just a little bit. <laughs> just a little bit. Yeah, yeah, just a little bit. So, um, you know, but, you know, I got to tell you guys, I'll be honest with you all. You know, funny, uh, you know, the first thing I thought to myself, my, my dad, he played, he played pro ball um, uh, for the Jets in 1970. And I remember talking to him and he said, he goes, well, I remember none of, none of them can take a hit like you can. So don't worry about it. You'll be fine. <laughs> so I just kind of think, yeah, what are you going to do? <laughs> so <laughs> it helps. <laughs> it helps. So, um, yeah, so that, that was, that was a lot. I got to tell you guys, it was a lot of fun. Um, looking back, spent a lot of time working, but you know, it's, it's real. And I, I, you know, Dr. Bill, I know you appreciate this. It's something that this is what we were trained to do, right? This is all the time we spend, all that time we spend in school and all that time we spend preparing for qualifying exams and giving presentations, right? To be able to, and it's not like you want to go through a pandemic all the time, but I got to tell you that experience really helped me to take a lot of the knowledge my coaches who are not scientists gave me to be able to present to people that are not scientists. Yeah, so I really, I've enjoyed that. So I see another, Jess, I think you have a question. Do you want to go ahead and um, read your question? Ask your question, I'm sorry. <laughs> if anybody has any questions, please, uh, you can raise your hand, you can come off mute, you can come off camera and ask it directly. But in the meantime, if nobody hey, so has Jess can't, yeah, Jess can't come off mute, but her question, and so Jess, um, I don't know where Jess is from, so maybe you can tell me so I can just kind of you know, say hello. <laughs> but um, Jess's question is, how does the competitive spirit and your ability to be a good team member play into your current work? So Jess, that's a wonderful question, right? So um, in my new role, um, in my new role as the associate director, and NIAD. So my predecessor, interestingly enough, was my one of my um, doctoral thesis advisors, right? So I've known him for many years. He's been mentoring me since I came out of undergrad. Um, nowhere near an athlete, I promise you. Um, but he had been with this branch for since 2000. So he had been there for over 21 years. Um, and so this branch is um, about, you know, a $20 million uh, program. And the guys were just used to his environment, his philosophy, his style. Um, and I've come in completely different individual, you know, um, he's a middle-aged white guy, right? Great individual. You come in as young, you know, six foot four black athlete. Right. And so the first thing I did was to just build that camaraderie with a lot of my, um, colleagues in the, in the branch, you know, let them know that I'm here to listen. Um, I'm here to work with them. Um, I want them to enjoy what they're doing, but at the same token, no, I'm here to support them to move forward in the mission. I let them also know that we are going to push the envelope. Right. Um, you know, they didn't bring me in here to keep the status quo. They brought me in to grow the branch. And that's exactly what we're going to do. Um, but I also made them also know that they're value. Right. They add a lot of value to the branch. And that my job is not to come in and just ignore everyone. My job is first is to listen to everything, you know, because I'll tell you, there's many times and I'm sure a lot of you guys that are athletes have been through. I didn't love everyone on my football team. Right. But I needed them. I needed them. Right. Um, and together we won a couple championships. Right. And I would walk the fire with them. They may not be best friends, but I would walk the fire with them. And that's the same way I kind of approach my branch. I said, guys, look, we may not all get along perfectly. We may not all be best friends. We have to respect one another. Right. And from that perspective, we all got to pull in the same direction. Right. And what's the overarching goal? So Jess, I try my best to, um, you know, let them know that we're all in this together. We're a team. We're going to work together. We're going to have failures. Um, and we'll deal with those failures behind closed doors. Um, I will never embarrass any of my colleagues um, in public. I may, you know, I'll praise in public and I will, you know, criticize in private. Um, and I made that crystal clear. Um, so she has another question. Hold on. Oh, this is, uh, this is for everyone. Oh, so yeah, letting people know when they're valued and see their need. Uh, yeah, it does go a very long way. So I will tell you, in those, in these three months that I've been with them, uh, or the six months that I've been with them, um, I, you know, I, I can't imagine not being with them now, right? And they're very happy. And, and so, so far, so good. <laughs> so far, so good. So, um, yeah, I enjoy it. I enjoy it a lot. I enjoy it a lot. Any other questions? And so, yeah, Jess is from Princeton, I see, huh? Okay. Uh, uh, I asked a question um, based off of based off the story. Uh, sure. How did you feel hearing that direct message that you won't make the NFL? Like most of us that play sports, <laughs> name of it. Yeah. And yeah. Is it a message in disguise that now? Sure. Yeah. 
Um, it was a hard message. <laughs> it was a hard message, right? Um, and you guys all remember when you know when you're a student athlete, you feel like you can do anything, right? You feel like you can you can run through a brick wall. You're you're you know, um, you just feel great. And and it, I think for me, um, it it wasn't as hard as I thought it would be because I was injured, right? I had the knee surgery. I tore my knee up. Um, you know, sophomore year and, um, and it was difficult, but I, I did realize, um, that it's okay. Right. I did realize that it was okay that I'm not going to go to show. Right. And that was okay. And I knew it was a long shot because everyone's telling you it's a long shot, but you always feel you can do it. Um, and it didn't mean I didn't keep training and, you know, keep working hard, but I also had to prepare for reality is that one and a hundred thousand make it. So I could be one of those that do not make it. Right. So, um, I really kind of, I, I will say this, um, I, I did my focus on my education and preparation for what I really could be doing was greater, right? Um, before I was an economics major, I was doing fine. Um, but then I moved over into a bio major, which was a little more intense. And I said, okay, well, if I'm not going, if I'm not going to go to the show, I got to become a doctor, <laughs> right? I got to do this. So I got to really... You know, so I really had to balance the time. And I'll tell you this, the other thing that was great about that is my coaches were very supportive, right? Um, you know, they always, you know, you know, I was only in study hall for one semester. Um, and after that, they always just, you know, I always, I made academic All-American every season because of my grades. And um, they never gave me a hard time. They knew I'd study film on my own. They really, and I matured, right? I mean, I came in there, I was 17. When I left, I was 21, right? So, you know, it was just, you know, I grew up. I grew up. So by the time I was 19, I, you know, they really realized, okay, he's going to go to medical school most likely or something. And so if he doesn't make a practice, if he's going to watch film, he can't make a film. That's fine, but he'll be fine on the game, on the game field. So it was okay. And I, to me, it was just four more years. Right? Some people don't even get to play college ball. Right. So I was happy and thankful I could play college ball. <laughs> you know, most of them it's over after your, your senior year and you never step on a field again. So, um, you know, and I got two rings to, to, you know, one my mom has and one I have, so it's good. <laughs> <laughs> so it was okay. It was okay. You know, let's we look back, back and I, yeah. Say it again. Let's go back for a second though. And so your college, your, your coaches were very supportive. Very. How did, how did you approach those coaches? Because that's a challenge that many of the athletes yeah. have is they're in programs where the coach knows they're not going to the league either, but they're still requiring them to come to practice and not take yeah. the science courses that they need to, for these careers. Yeah. Well, you know, I, um, you know, I was doctor, uh, you know, sorry, um, coach cater was, was great. Right. Um, we, you know, we would sit down and I'm sure a lot of you guys have gone through this as well that have played college sports, you know, it definitely is different than high school. Right. Um, and you know, you get an assessment after the season's over and you sit down with the coaches and they talk about kind of where you're at and where they see you going and things like that. And we had that hard conversation. I remember sitting in his office and, you know, he said, you know, JC, we're going to get your knee back and you'll be ready to go. And I said, well, coach, look, I gotta, I gotta prepare. <laughs> right. I said, you know, my knee hurts. I'm going to keep playing. I'm not going anywhere, but I really got to focus and get that GPX. I want to go to medical school. That was my goal. I want to go to medical school. Um, and, and he said, okay, well, you know, how, how does that work? And interestingly enough, the professor who was my advisor um, and him sat down the three of us and we talked about it. Right. And we, we really talked about it. Like, so there were some Sundays where we'd be watching films where I'd have to be in the lab because I'd miss a class or the practice. So the, 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 the school did a great job. The, the faculty did a wonderful job at working with each other to make sure that, okay, if, if, if JC needs to be at this lift session, he's got to miss this lab and he's gonna have to miss this film and make up on his own time, but we'll allow that excuse to go through. Right now it did take a year before coach Cater felt comfortable, right? At first he was very skeptical. He thought I should quit, you know, um, but it ended up working out when I came back my junior year, you know, I had a good season. Um, you know, I was, I came in and wait, I was in shape. I, my, I had no problem meeting my, my, my training times and I had a GPA of 3.2 at the time. Right. So it was going well. And I spent the summer there too. So, you know, so I was doing class in the summer and I would spend time with the coaches lifting and watching film and stuff like that. So it, it was a, it was a collaborative effort. It wasn't done by myself. It was a hard conversation, but you know, it's something you have to have. Right. I mean, you're growing up as an adult. You can't have your parents take care of you. Right. You got to go in and say, look, coach, this is what I want to do. I'm ha I want to be here, but I got to do this, too. And he, he was I was very blessed to have a coach like him that took care of me. So I, I see another question. Who are some of the mentors that you've had throughout your life and how have they changed you? OK, so 
Um, so I'll first start off. I think um, the first mentor I had was probably my high school football coach. Um, you know, he's the one that kind of really um, instilled that confidence in me that I, I was a good ball player. Um, I didn't play organized football. If you guys remember, um, with rec league and football, you have to be weight, right? And I was overweight. I could never play rec football. So I never really. So my first time of playing football um, at Seneca Valley High School was when I was 14. And he, he was great, you know, and he rode my ass. He lit me up. He, you know, but I, I knew he cared about me, right? Um, and that was hard. So I told myself, this guy's always yelling at me. You know, he, 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 and he one day pulled me aside. So I yell at you because I knew you can be good. And then I knew, okay, if he stops yelling, I'm in trouble, <laughs> you know? So he truly was my first mentor um, and really kind of made it crystal clear to me. And, and he, he was great with school too. He was very good with us, and, you know, um, with our players. And he always said, I'm, I never have to worry about you, JC. You're always, grades are great. You're fine. And he would honor the football. I'd say the next mentor truly was probably Dr. Lindgren, right? Which was my professor at, at, at Shepherd, right? So he is the one that was a student, former student athlete like us, um, you know, did D1, um, and had a doctorate in virology and he, you know, and it's, you know, I got to tell you guys, when I went to Shepherd, it, you know, I'll be honest, I remember, I, it's like, I'm not going to Shepherd. So in West Virginia, I was afraid there wasn't many black people. Um, I didn't see people like me, but, and every person that was an African-American male was an athlete, baseball, football, basketball, all of us, all of us at that time, right. At Shepherd college in the nineties. Um, but he just, you know, and it's a liberal arts college. You got to take a lot of these undergrad studies. But whatever it is, he just, he, he, he gravitated to me. He never let me, you know, stop. He never gave up on me. He always, you know, like I heard, he was, you know, he'd call me and with studying or high problems. And trust me, I got I failed these exams. Things happened. He was, he was, he was me the entire time. Um, you know, I say that the next one after undergrad probably was Rob Holman, who was the previous associate director at the, at NIAD. I, I ended up doing an internship in his lab. Uh, the summer before I started graduate school. And um, he's the one that found a way to, for the NCI to pay for me to go to grad school. And, and he has been with me and to this day, I mean, we talk still, to the, he's retired and um, he still talks to me this day. And then Dr. Reynolds, um, who was our associate director at the NCI. Um, and it's funny because, you know, I look back, I'm like, my dad and I'll talk. He goes, you know, you know, it's, just, it's great to see these old white men just, you know, not see you as some, just some black boy. They see you as a scientist, right? And they took me under their wing, right? I couldn't have done what I've done without any of them, right? Because they all had hard conversations with me, um, you know, but they also never, ever, ever didn't give me an opportunity to do something, right? And they always gave me the glory, right? If I did it right, they gave me the glory. And if I did it wrong, they pulled me aside. <laughs> so those four are the four mentors that I think have made a huge impact. I wouldn't be where I'm at without any of them without any of them, you know, and, you know, they always, they always say, you know, I'm very fortunate, I have a very strong family at home, um, but it takes a village, right? And so besides my parents, my dad is not a scientist, my mom's not a scientist, I was a teacher, um, you know, it, those were the individuals that really took me under their wings and allowed me to, to grow and, and others on the, along the road, but those four are the ones. Yeah, you're welcome. Are there any other questions? This has been great. I got to tell you, Dr. Will, I love this. I, this program you guys are doing, it's absolutely amazing. I really hope that, you know, these students appreciate the opportunity. Because I got to tell you, we would have loved to have had something like this when I was growing up. It would have been great. Because I, you didn't see this, right? You just kind of made your own path. So, um, and I hope a lot of you guys come back and give because you guys really need to grow the next generation. They're going to see you guys and know you guys went through it. Um, and they want to be where you are, right? And so it's an exciting time. It's going to be great to see some people of their color. <laughs> Because <laughs> as Dr. Mueller knows, there's not many of us. We're unicorns out here in the sciences. <laughs> Ask Dr. Bowles. I saw him come off camera for a second. Can you ask your question? We'd love to have your um, voice heard on this video recording. How you doing, Dr. Trey? Thank you so much for the talk. Um, yeah. Just a quick, just a quick question. How do? You, how would? You, what advice would you give um, in terms of like strategies for acquiring new mentors? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I think one of the things is, is just kind of never being afraid to reach out to anyone. Right. So, you know, feel comfortable and know that those individuals put their pants on just like you and I one leg at a time. Right. They don't float. Right. So if there's someone in that field that just you really just, God, you know, I want to be where they are. I want to get where they are. Reaching out to them and just kind of introducing yourself as one. 
The second thing I think is always great is taking the opportunity to understand some things they've done. They've done some papers. You know, I'd say anytime uh, a graduate student, undergraduate student, or high school student, pulled up one of my papers there, I love it. Oh, you want to talk about science? Oh, yeah, let's talk. Yeah, let's talk about ovarian cancer. So that made me think like, you know, you're investing, you're taking time out of your day to learn a little bit about my research. Is. And now we can talk about it. You, know, you got me sold, you got me booked, right? And those are the ones that are going to want to be with you, right? They're going to see you and remember you. And all the other thing I'll tell you is if you're ever given an opportunity to give a presentation, Anytime, I don't care how small it is, give it, right? That's one of the things that Dr. Homan always told me because someone's interviewing, right? Someone's gonna, and if you give a good talk, Aaron, and and like, for example, if you came down to the NIH and gave a talk, and I don't know you from Adam, like, oh, I get it, Aaron was nice, you know, I got, and then all of a sudden I see you apply for a position with my branch, I remember you. I'm gonna remember that you made an impact, right? So never, never shy away for an opportunity to give a presentation, ever. That's one thing I love. I love giving presentations because I want people to know that I'm good, right? And you want people to know that you're good. And they're going to want to be, they, and they want you to be a part of their scientific family, right? Because at the end of the day, I promise you this, if you are, if you're my, if you were my student, you're someone that worked with me, and then all of a sudden you're now the, you know, the director of, of NIDA, you know, he's mine. He, he, he learned under me. He trained with me. They want that, right? They want to have that type of relationship. So yeah, hundred percent. Every, I, in my eyes, I've been blessed. If you have the opportunity, get a mentor, find good ones that you want to work with. And build that relationship. You know, they want to help. I'll throw one question this out there. Along the lines sure. of mentors and getting the help, how important is it for somebody to see you and see the value in you? Because a lot of times, um, I believe that we try to do things in life, but sometimes we don't even get the backing from the closest friends. Or the I know. I know. I actually have somebody see you and say, yeah, you can do it. Yeah. So, you know, you know, one of the things that, I, and it's something I kind of, I'll be honest with you, I, I, um, a bridge I crossed many years ago, and right? I think it's a wonderful question. Um, there are going to be haters out there, right? Because there are always those individuals that you're going to remind them of what they could have accomplished, right? And you're going to notice those people quick, right? I promise you. And those people, in my eyes, and I'll be honest with something the cancer is to, they're cancers in my life. I don't want them to part of my life, right? So I, I eliminate those individuals. I'm not saying we can't still be cool and I can talk to you and, you know, you know, maybe watch a game here and there at a bar, but I'm not kicking, right? You're not a, you're not one of the main characters in my life, right? So that's first and foremost. I don't, anyone that's going to be any kind of cancer in my life, I, there, I don't need them. I don't have time. There's enough things in this life trying to beat us down already. Right? So I don't need any assistance. <laughs> that's first and foremost. I'll be honest with you. The second thing is, is I, I think a lot of times for you to be noticed, right? And this is something I, it, you know, I've learned is that I've got to be able to deliver on the small things, right? So if, for example, if Dr. Reynolds, who was my past director, asked me to do small tasks that he needed to get accomplished and I can't deliver those, and he's not going to allow me to go out and do the big things because that's now outside of, of his control, right? So I always learned as much as I may not have liked a certain task, most likely there was a reason he was asking me to do it, right? And it was usually because he wanted to, A, I had to learn something that he wanted me to learn on my own. He couldn't tell me. Secondly, he wanted to make sure that I could deliver the information he needed. Because if I'm sitting in front of the NCI director or the NIA director, he can't protect me at that moment, right? So I've got to be able to show them that I can do that job, right? And then I also got to let them know that I want to do that, right? My goal is this. I want you to be aware that my goal is to get here. I love being here now, and I'm going to take that time and learn from you. But I, I tell you, I told Dr. Reynolds right, when, I, when he hired me, I said, my goal is to be in your seat when you retire. I told him that. I was very honest. That's what I want. So I need you to give me as much knowledge as you can give me because I will be the first black associate director at the NCI and Prepper. So I told him. I was very honest. And he said, Jim, I love it. And he was on me. And on me. Day one. He just gave me a ton of stuff. So that's how I got news. I was very honest. I'm not, I, I'm not going to pull any punches with him. I'm not going to hide it. I'm not going to pretend. I'm not going to beat around the bush. My goal is this. If you're going to be a part of that goal, great. If you're not, then I'm going to roll over by it and I'm going to move on. And I, I'm honest, right? It's nothing personal. It's just that I have goals, right? You know, I got a family, I got daughters, I got a, I got life. <laughs> so that I've been pretty clear with that. Does anybody else have any other? Questions? If not, I will play your video. Okay, so I don't see anybody uh, raising their hand, so I'm going to connect to your video. 
My name is James Cherry. I'm overseeing the Advanced Biocomputing Center, which deals with a lot of the informatics for up here in Frederick National Laboratory. I get to work with some amazing scientists, and it's fun. One of the other hats I wear besides the scientific program director is the scientific advisor for all the students that come to campus. One of the missions at the NCI is to train the next generation. So we have what's called the Warner H. Christian program, which is high school students in the area. They work side by side with the scientists, but sometimes they'll come to talk to me about other things as well. Someone did that for me. I feel I need to play it forward. My grandmother played a major role. She was a principal in New York City Public Schools. To her, education was the key to all the success. No one can take education away from you. She told me that all the time. My grandmother passed away of ovarian cancer. So when we lost her, I kind of, you know, I didn't understand it, didn't understand, you know, why, you know, what happened. And so that, for me, that was probably, I think, the first spark. I went to a small liberal arts college in, in West Virginia, Shepherd College at the time, now it's Shepherd University. I was on a football scholarship. I was an econ major. I wasn't even a biology major. I thought, you know what, I'm going to play football for a while, four more years, I'll graduate and go do something in business. But for those of you that know liberal arts colleges, you have to take all of classes. And that was probably my first introduction to a mentor. This individual, Dr. Lundy Jank, came to football games. He lived in town, him and his wife. And um, I took his general biology class and I ended up having the highest grade in the class. And he thought, well, God, what's your major? And I thought, oh, it's, it's, it's econ. He says, well, why? And I said, it's, I don't know. And he just kept hounding me and said, look, you need to... You need to think about doing biology, you know, this is where you need to go. So that's kind of how it happened, more or less. <laughs> so when I graduated from Shepherd, I really didn't know what I wanted to do yet. I had gotten accepted to John Hopkins to the master's program. I was working that summer before I went to Hopkins at a small biotech company. Dr. Robert Homan, who is the deputy chief down at NIAD, was the chief scientific officer. Dr. Homan took me under his wing and we worked on chemistry platforms and my thesis project. After that, he said, you know what, you need to get your PhD. When you get somebody like Jim that's young, smart, hardworking, and just really wants to advance, it just makes you feel good to be able to help somebody to move forward. He had the knowledge that I wanted. I didn't know anything coming out of undergrad, <laughs> and so I had to learn. Um, and he was always willing to teach me. I talk about Dr. Homan, I talked about Dr. Ledgerdink, Dr. Monroe, who is my advisor, who's a part of the Frederick National Laboratory, he played a role. But there's a number of them. I always say to my students that the NCI raised me, and they did. As a mentor, it's very important that you take a vested interest in the mentee. And that's what my mentors did, um, you know, from Dr. Monroe to Dr. Homan um, to, in my opinion now, Dr. Reynolds, who is mentoring me now. I think a lot of people confuse success with big house, big car, but I think it's who you touch. To hear about the kids that have worked in the laboratory that are moving on and maybe one day I'll, I'll be working for them, I don't know. Um, that's a success. Any student that wants to have a career in science, healthcare, or anything, it's, it's not going to be easy. But anything worth having is not going to be easy. Just hold on tight. It's a bumpy ride, but at the end of the day, it's going to be all worth it. So here's a little bit, little bit of background about myself, but um, I got to tell you guys, I hope a number of you guys come back and, and, and talk to the students because I, having you guys involved is going to be huge for them to see that, you know, that you guys have been there and now where you're at, it's going to play a huge role in their success. I promise you. Corey, did you have a question? Yeah, actually, I, I did actually want, I meant to ask it a bit earlier, but I was um, listening in audio at, at that time. But when you're talking about, um, how you were like the only um, like black person in like these classes when you went to the school. Yeah. <laughs> how, um, can you tell me more about like how that like how did that uh, like affect you? Do you, do you how do you like um, not let it like like stay on your mind? You know what I mean? You're you're, sure. you're in these areas. You're trying to get somewhere. You got to wonder. You got to wonder. First, you're wondering. You know, obviously, why is why are you the only person which is kind of called here? But you're also wondering what they might be thinking of you. You know what I mean? Sure. Thinking, like, Oh, he's only here because of this and that. He's only here right, right. Of yeah, yeah, no, Corey. Yeah. That's a great question. That's a great question. So, uh, like I told you earlier, you know, when I chose Shepherd, I, I knew that you know, as a black athlete, that's why I was there, right? And I'll be honest with you, I think probably majority of the student body knew that, right? Um, you know, um, uh, for me, I'm more of an extrovert, right? So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to get to know you, right? And I'm going to let you know this is who I am. Right. So I had no problems talking to anyone. Right. Um, I don't care if you were some pot up town from, you know, southern West Virginia. I was going to talk to you um, and I was going to treat you with respect and I was going to demand the same respect back. 
at the same token, you know, I will say this, Corey, and I know this because I was I was your age a while back. <laughs> I, I I also used to think, well, you know, what are they thinking about me? What, but as you get older, and I'm sure, you know, Dr. Miller and Mr. Small say the same thing. You don't worry about that as much because they're not your main characters, right? They're only going to play a small role. May, some may play a very strong role, right? Become a main character in your life, right? They really may. But some are going to be a passing character. And they're going to play some role in the light and help make choices, right? So I don't think about those things. Um, and and I, for me, I will say this. I, I can tell you that being a shepherd allowed me to, A, appreciate being in a predominantly white school, right? which is country, right? But my grandmother also told me one thing. She goes, sweetheart, the first thing you have to understand is that you're never going to look for black, brown, or white. You're going to look for mixed. So you better work with everything, right? And so you just have to, you know, there's a period of time where you're going to have to say to yourself, you know what? I can't worry about what they're thinking because my goal is this. And if they like me, great. If we're friends, great. If they're not, well, then they don't belong here, right? And God has a plan and he doesn't want them with me. So I don't let it bother me anymore, right? And I'll be honest with you right now, I'm the only black male in leadership, right? I told Dr. Dr. Miller this. I'm the only black male in leadership at NIA, right? And let's be realistic. The NCI, they put that up and it's it's been up since 2015, right? I'm the only black male and I don't work at the NCI anymore, <laughs> right? You see what I'm saying? So, you know, it just is what it is, right? And I, that's fine. That's fine. Because at the end of the day, they're going to think what they think about us, right? But if you have that ticket, right, which is that degree, and your mind, they can't take nothing away from us, right? And so once you get outside that door and then you're talking to science, right? And you can relate, then you belong, right? Doesn't matter how you got there. It matters if you stay there. <laughs> and that was important to me, right? And that's why I'm, you know, Nia brought me over, right? Because I can do the work, right? Now, now, are they doing the same thing? Yeah, I got videos coming up and I, I know why. I told Dr. Miller that, <laughs> you know, I'm a unicorn, right? <laughs> I'd say it, but I'm a unicorn. <laughs> so you can't let it bother you, brother. You just can't let it bother you. You just got to focus on you and remember what God's put in your heart. You're going to do it right. Don't worry about it. I appreciate it. Thanks. If anybody else has any other questions, if not, let's approach in 7.15. We actually <laughs> we had a great discussion. I don't want to keep everyone too long. Some of yeah. us are still at work. I got to travel back. <laughs> <laughs> guys this is absolutely amazing i you know hats off to dr Miller and Mr. Smalls. this is absolutely wonderful program um you know i gotta tell you i i'm really reaching out to me to be doing something like this out here in the area this is absolutely amazing and i really if any of you guys need anything please feel free to reach out to uh mr smalls or dr Miller. i'm happy to talk if you guys have any questions um you know we have internships um, fund it if you know if you're looking to be in the biological science. I'd love to have you guys down here. I'd love to get more people that look like me in the labs and help them grow. Um, so feel free. I'm I, you know it's always open. It's always open. And if you just want to talk, I, please feel free to reach out. You know, you know DC is only about four hours away by turnpike, <laughs> so it's not too bad. <laughs> There's a question in the chat. If you're if it possibly be sure. share your email, of course, hundred percent. You have my email. Feel free to send it out and. I'd love to talk to anybody that needs any help. I'm always here. Okay. Yeah. So, Dr. Cherry, I, I, I would be remiss to not tell you that I appreciate you because I did mention that I met you almost 15, close to 20 years ago. <laughs> and although we were the only two brothers in the room and I was new to the group, you welcomed me to the group. Automatically. I appreciate that. So, uh, yeah. Thank well, you. let me tell you. I'm glad we did because, you know, we connected and uh, look who's to say we'll, we'll be together sooner than you think. <laughs> yeah, right. So I, I'm very happy we were able to meet. <laughs> Great. Thank you for joining us. Anthony, take it yes. away. Yeah, thank you so much for your time. And we appreciate yes. everything. I've just put the chat, uh, your email in the chat for everyone. Yeah. But if anybody has any questions and connecting with anybody that has spoken for the game plan series, please reach out to me. Any questions at all, please. Um, I know everyone's aware of our website already because you're here, so I'm not going to go over that. But um, if anything, please reach out, have any questions, anything like that. Once again, another exciting edition of Game Plan. Thank you all for coming out. Everyone have a wonderful evening. Be home safe. And since we won't have the next game plan for next month, happy holidays. Enjoy your Christmas and your festivities with me. Be safe, guys. It was great meeting everybody. Take care.
Thank you.